Hey, welcome to the drill. Steve Lowry, Tom Hofarth, and John McKelvey. We're Hello. back at you, and this is our good friend, writer, author, David Davis. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hello. Welcome. We are so happy to have you here this week, because that means you weren't here last week. <laughs> when we did not just our worst we show. We had The worst show <laughs> in the history of doing shows. In fact, and one of the main reasons it was so bad is that that headset you're wearing uh, attempted yes. to strangle me yes. while we were interneting. Uh, it made yes. for good comedy, though. It, really, yeah. And a trip to the ER. <laughs> so that was uh, great. Hey, I um, hope you've been checking out on the Game Takes app. And if you ch uh, follow us on our Twitter feed, we do a daily um, little podcast called The Drill Morning Briefing where we kind of tackle the issues of the day and we use this more for in-depth stuff. One of the funny things we got in today was about weird Dodger memorabilia. <laughs> I was talking about my Tommy Lasorda garden gnome. You were talking about your... I have an Oral Hershiser thermos that's just Oof. ghastly looking. Oof. <laughs> nice. And yeah. David has written a piece about perhaps the most famous piece of Dodger memorabilia, which is? The Kirk Gibson home run ball from the 1988 World Series. And where is that home run ball? Who the hell knows? <laughs> <laughs> but you came the closest to finding it, and you did a piece... I mean, maybe this was five, six years ago. Something like that. Uh, yeah. For LA Weekly or SB Nation. SB Nation, I think. And, you know. But he's be re he purposed it a few times, as good freelancers do. Yes. And he so could, much do a, to learn. could do a book about it as well. Yeah. But the, the gist of it was that um, it was caught by an uncle with his niece and put it in a sock in a drawer, gave it to his girlfriend, and we just don't know about it. So... It's a, yeah, it's one of those convoluted stories, but, but also speaks to the fact that it was such a different era, yes. you know, of media and right. no television cameras stayed on, right. you know, sort of the fight for the ball. But I guess it bounced off a couple hands. It fell on the ground. This guy who later claimed it was his first game ever that he had, <laughs> you know, and he just right. happened to be there out in the bleachers. But they produced this, like, uh, uh, picture of him holding the ball with the date on it right right at, at the house after the game they brought it home and yeah they polaroid that shot was, or something yeah that was sort of their that their was, only evidence right, quote unquote right, was they right. they came home afterwards there was a photo there is a photo of the guy holding the ball with i think his niece right. or whatever it was and there is a date stamp but obviously that you know it's not definitive right, definitive what would, world what would be the advantage of not coming forward and saying this is the ball or is it to somehow drive up the maybe the value of the ball well, if if they could have proved that it was the actual ball, yeah. I mean, that's the most valuable piece of memorabilia of L.A. Dodger yes. uh, history. But right. they, you know, they couldn't get it. Uh, you know, you now have to, in this day and age of memorabilia, you have to have it verified and the, the auction people. Some watermark is on it. And, uh, and, yeah. and now World Series balls are actually, they have all these kinds of things where you can actually make sure which ball is which. Right? And they have right. a verifier at each game now who takes every game used ball, puts a thing on a, you know, post-it note, puts it in a box so they can resell it, so they can, you know, prove that this was, it's, it's like he's a notary guy just sitting right there with so everything. Just, just to summarize, um, we have guys who verify balls, but we don't make steel in this country anymore. Is that how it's going now? That's where we're at? Right. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have yeah, guys who microphone. do my There we go. <laughs> yeah, I was doing the stuff over here. Yeah. Uh, we make steel, just nobody in America can afford it. <laughs> That's right. And they also do that with the, with the balls if somebody's approaching a milestone sure. so right. like pool holes is coming up to They'll 3, bring in a whole new balls yeah. Yeah. for that that sort of thing we but, were talking about another milestone which is dave has also written about yet another amazing moment in dodger history which is the time the two guys run on the field they're going to burn the flag rick monday who will eventually become a, a dodger but as a cub runs over and grabs the flag you did a piece about what happened to everybody and i guess what we're most interested in is what happened to the father and the son yeah, it's actually still sort of a mystery. I did make contact with the son. Yeah. Um, we've had, we had a couple convers very, very brief phone conversations. I know sort of where he lives, et cetera. Mm. Uh, but he asked to be private. Yeah. And uh, I, I respected that. Right. Um, I was able to track down his, uh, his mother's relatives. Um, I knew where the father was living, so I knew sort of the story. Right. right. Uh, but but yeah, it's it yeah. it is. In other words, what was the real mystery is why did you do this? Yeah. Right. And 
This occurred on the, in 1976, so it was the bicentennial. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of outrage, um, real and imagined. Oh, my God, they're burning the flag, which, by the way, whether you like it or not, is legal mm -hmm. in this. It's a form of, you know, expression. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but these, the only quote that we had at the time was that they were protesting um, that the, uh, the, the wife or the mother was being held in a mental institution oh, mm. in okay. somewhere in the Midwest. You know, good luck trying to verify that, you know, <laughs> right, I mean, right. with privacy, et cetera, et cetera, right. and all these years later. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I know a little bit about what happened, but yeah. I obviously interviewed Rick Monday and others. Is he sick and tired of talking about it, by the way? No. Oh, he, li he still no. likes talking about it? Okay. No, he's... Yeah. He uses the flag as a... Uh, a calling card in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Okay. He, Visiting well, vets. And, I thought yeah. you were going to say it's like a table card. <laughs> <laughs> no, he has. He, he used has, to. He has raised a lot of yes. money in a in a good way for good causes. He also told me something which I don't know if he had talked about a lot, and it and it's in the piece. But um, I said, you know, where 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 do you keep the flag? And he said, well, we used to keep it at home, and he goes, now it's it's safely put away because we've had threats, mm. and uh, on. I guess his life or his or what? Yeah. yeah and it there's some weird developments that have happened and so he's um but having said that look it, you know he was having he had his best year that year as a cub he wow. was traded to the Dodgers cuz he was the hometown guy right he he has a really interesting baseball yeah, career sure. i mean uh he's the first he was in the college world series that he won at ASU he was the first guy drafted very first drafted drafted yep. man by the A's by the Kansas A's. City A's Kansas yeah. City so he's had this crazy and then he gets traded the Dodgers you know they were salivating it for him and then when he rescues the flag the you know, right. The he hits that key up. home run that gets them in the 81 World Series. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the story about this <clears throat> particular mm -hmm. piece is in this book called L.A. Baseball, which is based on an exhibit that's at the downtown library. The centerpiece of this is is, is photos downtown at a, LA, by downtown the way, Central LA. Library. Yeah. So the photos for this book and for the exhibit have been called from the L.A. Public Library files. A lot of them from the old Herald Examiner files which produced the most iconic photo of Rick Muddy saving the flag with the two guys, you know, trying to light it. Yeah. And so it's the centerpiece of this book, the whole oral history of what happened in that day, talking to everybody involved, Rick. Um, the photographer's the, the wife. The photographer, uh, yeah, the photographer's wife. The whole story about photographer himself is amazing. Yeah. Just the whole background of that and, and what happened to his career. Yeah. So um, there's so many backstories about these photographs that Dave knows and Dave went through. The, the actual exhibit probably has three dozen photos. Yeah, it's a small exhibit. And this book has hundreds. Yeah. And a lot of the great background of. And, and Tom and I were thank there, uh, the opening. Yes. And, and thank two you. things that jumped out at me. Number one, there were pictures of when the Dodgers were coming. They're actually being welcomed. What surprised me is in such a segregated city as Los Angeles, black people, white people, uh, Latino people, all together. The Dodgers really were one of these things, and it, it just goes to show the Lakers do this too. Sports. It, it it does bring the city together as early as what fifty eight right mm -hmm. yeah. fifty eight yeah. yeah they they were I I would the only thing I would say on that is the it, the the Mexican American yeah. community was a little bit slower mm. to warm to the Dodgers for a couple of reasons one O'Malley they never had a star who was Mexican American right. until Fernando right. Um, and frankly, because of how the Dodgers acquired the land and all of the politics yes. involved, there was a lot of resentment in the right. community against the Dodgers. It really did take Fernando's emergence and Fernando mania to change the narrative. Right. Um, which isn't to say the Latino community didn't embrace the Dodgers when they first came. There were there were some who did and, right. and still do. But it, it did, there was a... It took time. took some time. And but, of course, but now I, I would say they're the most passionate probably followers of the team. Yeah. Very much so. Very, yeah. 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 And there's 50 years of L.A. baseball history before the Dodgers even mm -hmm. come. Yeah. So right. Not in just Pacific Coast League, but in, in the Hispanic yeah. club teams. Yeah. And, Recreational. And, and you have pictures here, too, of women playing the game in the early 1900s that are yeah. amazing to see. Yeah. And it's just part of the history of Los Angeles, not just sports, but... History. Yes, absolutely. And th that was the other thing was the Legion Park. And you have pictures of people being forcibly taken. And it, it's such a bizarre thing because Dodger Stadium is like L.A.'s version of Disneyland. It's this one special place. We, we talk, a lot of people don't even go there to watch the games. Right. You just go there, you get this happy feeling. 
but you see these photos you're conflicted yeah, <laughs> yeah no absolutely yeah. i and i agree with you dodger stadium's one i i think hollywood bowl is mm. another where yeah. you right. just are like yeah who's who's playing right. oh yeah, yeah right we oh just, i'm having a great time we anyway just can't yeah, believe exactly. we're here enjoying it that's yeah. all we are doing and and but the but for those people who were evicted from their homes they were going to be evicted anyway right i mean there was some project housing project that they were going to build there and eventually do it but then it got delayed and the o'malley thing happened but it's it's a history that the o'malley's dance around and but the pictures don't lie yeah it's it's a very complicated mm -hmm. issue yeah. and, and you know you you write what you know your first draft on something is you write what you think okay this is what happened then you go and do more research right. like, oh whoa no that guy wasn't so villainous and I, you know, to some degree, O'Malley was an innocent bystander. He, right. He right. certainly didn't know the whole, no. the entire right. No, he wasn't told everything because... You, you guys no. have just described for a writer, you do it like a feature, you get all the way to the end, you know this is the story, and the last guy goes, well, you know, all that was fake, right? Like, oh, why did you just tell me that? And you got to call your editor and tell him. Yes. Yeah, you have a great piece out right now on Deadspin about Gold's Gym. Terrific piece. And Thank you. David has this genius of finding pieces that I think a lot of other writers assume have already been written, sure. that the definitive piece has already been written. It's like the journalistic equivalent of the good-looking girl who never gets called to the prom or invited to the prom because you assume, of course, everyone's asked her out. Dave does this time and again. How did the Gold's Gym piece come along? Because, I, again, you've written the definitive piece now. I just assumed it probably was done 10, 20 years ago. There had been some, right? There, there had yeah. been some. But th thank you, first yeah. of all. That's uh, that's very kind of you. I've, for years, I've written sort of on the fitness movement, and mm -hmm. I was lucky enough. I interviewed Joe Gold when he was alive. I yeah. interviewed Jack Lalane, a lot of these guys who were at Muscle Beach, Steve Reeves, mm -hmm. oh, right. who yeah. just. So I, I had always had this interest, and this this piece sort of bounced around a little bit not to go too much into the inside baseball but i i started to do it for los angeles magazine uh one of the guys i ended up interviewing for the piece um he was he he recently passed away but he was basically sort of homeless on venice beach and so i ended up doing a feature on him mm -hmm. and putting the oral history aside it then got revived for another publication um, and as I, um, when I had pitched it, I said, hey, I don't, I can't guarantee you that I'm going to get an interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And at first the publication said, oh, that's fine. Don't worry about yeah. it. And then somewhere along the line, they said, no, we need Arnold. Mm. So I had to, you know, plan C. I, I spent a year trying to get Arnold talking with his lawyers, assistants, all of that sort of thing. And he never wanted to sit down yeah. with me, um, unfortunately. Um, and so finally took it to Deadspin where I had a relationship and the nice thing about that was I could go really super long because yeah. it was online. Why There's, do you think Arnold was probably uh, cautious about participating? Yeah, I, I, I would love to, Arnold, if you're, if you're watching. <laughs> Uh, of course. <laughs> I, D this is the drill, Dave. Come the on. drill. Yeah, the, the drill. I don't know. No. Um, I, you know, my my sort of working default yeah. uh, thing is that he, he he prefers not to talk about bodybuilding, fitness, et cetera, mm. with mainstream okay. media and people who are going to ask him serious questions about steroids etc cetera, etc cetera, which he's admitted doing and it's talked about but i think he wants to put that aside you point out in the piece in fact that he's bought up everything having to do with pumping iron yeah on the great documentary which in your piece it sounds like eh, there's a little setup uh he wants all the outtakes all that stuff all about control and i yeah. i it, it, actually i had not my assumption was because in the film that if you if you watch the film now it's he still will talk about you see him smoking pot mm -hmm. there's some things that are that pumping are, iron we're talking about right <laughs> yeah. yes yeah, yeah, correct yeah. excuse me yes exactly and so he bought up as, as as you said Steve. he bought up all of the outtakes all the photos and it was like well why and apparently i, I saw a couple of clips on this there was when he when he was running for governor the first time <laughs> right. it came out that there may have been some pro hitler pro nazi comments in those outtakes that he did not want and he had to address it because it had come out right and i'm saying this allegedly right but but and this of course, is what it was this was the time in our politics where that would have been seen as a negative <laughs> 
<laughs> and even if he was joking at right, the time, right, right. it's no. no. Right. And again, it, getting a little more inside baseball, the process by which you put this oral history together has to be ridiculously hard, no matter how easy it looks like it's done. Tommy, let's just tell them. Yeah, right. Oral history is when you read some story and basically the writer will lead you into it. And then after that, it's just quote after quote. So if you've read books like uh, Those Guys Have All the Fun, I right, think is, right. man. A lot of the James Miller books James about... Miller. Um, a book about uh, the Letterman liar. And, and Leno. Right. It was like that. There's James a book about all those. So he's it's the master, right? He's the master, right? It's James one of Miller. The, right. Yeah. It's one of those books that it seems like an easy process, it flows but if you're a writer, well. you know. How did you go about doing that? How many hours of interviews does it take to do that? Yeah, well, as as Tom mentioned, I mean, James James Miller is the, I mean, reading that ESPN book, reading the CAA book, I mean, those... First of all, just to line up interviews with right. those people. And then to get them to, yeah. And, and then, then to, to get sit them down and, and repeat the same stories. They have to be repeating a lot of information. Right. And, and that's you just pick the best hours, out. Hours of that. Transcribing that, yeah. which oh. I'm sure he doesn't do, but somebody is doing sure. for him. But right. yeah. And then putting it together. And and you're right. It, it's a it's a but he puzzle. has a book. I mean, you have a thousand, <laughs> a ten thousand piece story. Yeah, yeah. No, that's I, even so. How you're often? chop 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 chop. Yeah, I I I don't know. I interviewed except for Arnold. I'm still here. <laughs> uh, I, I have about forty people. And, and, and were there some that you had to go back because you needed that yeah. piece? And, yeah. yeah, you went back, or or and then you would always, you know, it's one of these things that you ask when you know you know this question like at the end. Anybody else I should talk to? Yeah. And right. they give you five guys you've yeah. never heard of. And you're like, ah, right. okay. And, you know, three of them you can get, two have died, and one, you know, will tell to you me, no way. To me, the most fascinating person in, in your piece is Ken Sprague, who right. even though we know Gold's Jam and we think of Joe Gold, Joe, Ken Sprague is basically like Ray Kroc. <laughs> Right, yeah, right. Yeah, because Ray Kroc so. didn't invent McDonald's, the McDonald's did, but he's the one who saw the possibilities. Yeah. Joe Gold invents Gold's Gym, but doesn't see the possibilities. Ken Sprague does, right? Yeah. Very, yeah. very good point. Yeah. And and um, he and he was great to talk to. Yeah. Ken Sprague, but but yeah, I mean, most people see Gold's Gym. First of all, most people don't know that it's from a guy's name. Joe Gold. Right, right. right. I had no idea. Yeah. Right. right. Whose, no name, whose name wasn't even Joe. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, yeah, he just was given the name by a friend. <laughs> yeah, he's from Boyle Heights, guy from way back when. But Not but, a very creative friend, but, yeah. Joe. We well, want to call him Lil Abner, but it, wouldn't, it didn't stick. Yeah. And his, I mean, he had an amazing career. He was... I, I, there were, you know, stuff that didn't make it, in, you know, the yeah. outtake, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, he was in the 50s when it was still, like, all natural and fitness... He was the eye candy for the May West Review. So it was all of these oh, wow. guy, George Eiferman, who was like Mr. America in right. 1950, muscles. whatever, muscle guys. Yeah. Zab, Zabo, Zabo, who was his like, you know, chief assistant, all yeah. these guys. So anyway, he had this long story, but he didn't really own Gold's Gym for very long. That's right. And he went back into the Merchant Marines. Sold and was, it off. And yep. Disappointed yeah. he did. Yep. And then Ken Sprague comes along, and it's a little bit different time. We're right. now talking in the 70s, and they're looking, they're they're understanding that, hey, a T-shirt that's a cool T-shirt with Gold Jim, hey, that works. That's valuable. Right? Yeah, and, you know, they would tell me these stories. Well, we got, you know, someone, you know, Farrah Fawcett to wear it for a People magazine shoot. And right. we're like, whoa. And, you know, takes off yeah. so he did he saw the possibility and then the owners that came after him saw the possibility of franchising mm -hmm. and that's as you say like that's the, the story Kroc. that's the hollywood story though true i mean and these guys saw charles atlas and all that stuff going on in the east coast and it was too expensive to bring the equipment to gold's gym so joe gold makes this stuff in his garage yeah. coffee cans and cement yeah. yeah i mean that's how it happens that's how it's <laughs> right. and and there was also it also in southern california joe weeder right you know yes. comes west he's you know they're from montreal originally then right. new jersey he comes west right with the weeder enterprise i think they were in woodland hills they were for a they long, were long time. right behind the la daily news office <laughs> right. right that close to right it. and he you know he really got it that yeah. Yeah. the people want to look at bodies and sand and sun and you yes. know his magazines were huge but huge, but right. it's such a different time because as dave points out in his piece in the 60s and even into the 70s professional athletes not only weren't weightlifting weightlifting was seen as destructive Do to the body yeah, doctors would say it's, yeah. it's the it, worst it, thing you'd to always do. hear it would lock you up yeah right exactly. or would make you slow right and that's why it's interesting and you know you it, you can't talk about weightlifting, et cetera, without talking about steroids, of course. Sure. But 
but you're right. So you you look at the different, like look at the difference in uh, bodies. It's starting. <laughs> It's slippage. <laughs> but you look at the difference in bodies, like um, Len, Len Dykstra, yes. for example. Oh. Right. Like, look at him when he's starting his career mm. with the Mets. Right. And then, all right, he gets into lifting, and all of a sudden, he's this right. behemoth. Right. And it's like, that's, it starts changing coming out of Gold's Gym in the 70s, and people are going, you know what? It's not just about aesthetics and a look. Right. It's... It actually works. <laughs> yeah, this exactly. stuff works. You f and you feel better. There's a there's an element of that as well. Right. And uh, you know why they didn't understand that with football for for so long yeah. is sort of ridiculous. But it's that's football old school coaches like no water, don't drink water, man. <laughs> oh, you yeah. know, oh stuff. Uh, like that was that. still a thing when I was in like seventh eighth grade football. It was like the no water, everybody. Yeah, but um, quick inject interjection. Yeah. Have you guys been watching Hard Knocks? On mm -hmm. HBO. I've just seen little bits. Just little yeah. bits. Okay, so Bob Wiley, the offensive line coach, really big guy. He's, uh, he in one of his uh, early scenes, he starts talking about how uh, when they're, they're all stretching, he's like, I get to sit down, thank God. But he starts complaining that stretching is completely overrated. Right. It's completely overrated, and he goes... Uh, you know, we had we won two world wars, and all those guys did was push ups, sit ups, and jumping jacks, <laughs> and you know, right. just basic calisthenics. Right. They didn't stretch. Were they worried about stretching before you go? And and so he's yoga. That that whole change <laughs> is kind of what you're talking about with the '70s and all that. Oh yeah. So it, that's just interesting aside. Well, I there's think. that there's that iconic photo that actually just it seemed to. Um, uh, show up a few years ago, but now it gets uh, a lot of play, which is Len Dawson. It might actually be at the Super Bowl, <laughs> right. smoking a butt. <laughs> so what are we doing on the tight end? You know, come here, get another one. Right. Yeah, I mean, right. it, that was like Super Bowl four, I think. I right? think so, that they well, won, by the way. Yeah, the yeah. Chiefs Did, won. <laughs> didn't they have the Dick Allen with him? Dick's in the, a that lot was, of Dick Allen. That, oh, was, yeah. Uh, yeah. that was a cover of Sports Illustrated. Yeah. He's got a cigarette and he's yeah. juggling baseballs. But, but yeah. touch away. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> right. Hey, and ruined. The, the interesting thing on the you know the advent. It's a, a sidebar, but the advent of the of the steroids is. You know, it it came from sort of the a cold war. You know, the Russians yes. started using them, so the American weightlifters were like, "Wait, we got to get in on that." Right. And then some straight it, Ivan Drago's. <laughs> <laughs> right. And there there was a story. Somebody else did a great story on where it's where it sort of transitioned to the mainstream a little bit, or at least the start was the San Diego Chargers. There was a weight guy there who had a connection and knew mm. about this. And he put, this is like 62, 63. It might have even been their, like champ, their championship year or wow. whatever. And he had all those guys on it. Whoa. And, you know, they, they the did. The Ron Mix guys? Yeah, was, like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That yeah. era. And yeah. I think there were, it came out of, of course, like Louisiana or New Orleans. But wow. they, uh, Billy Cannon, who was the Heisman, right. he apparently, you know, 1958 at LSU and. Anyway, it, oh it's it's a, that's wow. a whole other. But it's a whole other, other book, another <laughs> magazine, another <laughs> project for yes. for David. Uh, but, and he's got a list of these things that have not been properly researched and vetted out, and that's what he does. I mean, that's. Yeah. He's got the time and the energy and the know-how to do this year after year. What do you year. mean he has the time? He but I, a personal <laughs> life? The face he made when you said time, energy, and all that, he was like, I don't know. <laughs> no one's asking Dave to do it. Time is what, <laughs> usually I say I don't have the time to do it before right. I even know what the time is. So. I've, I've, been, I've, I've, been, right. I've been very fortunate right. in that. But, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, and it, you know, you know, as, as freelancers, it's a struggle. Yeah. And, and, you know, you sacrifice here on this for that. And, yeah. um, you know, of course, I quit and started to said, I'm going to write books right at the right. time when, <laughs> when everyone was not reading books. <laughs> and everybody's well, not reading me, books. Show them the, uh, so this is, this is Waterman, which is an outstanding book. Came out in 2015. Correct. Yes. Thank you. About Duke Kam <laughs> Kahanamoku. Got I it. always Nailed screw it. that up. Thank you very Nailed much. It. We're not even going to give any other d <laughs> yeah, pronunciation. Yeah, so now it's Duke. That's it's, all you get now. It's just Duke from now <laughs> Yet on. Yet another example of, a, of such an iconic figure that, again, I just assumed, well, uh, of course someone had written, but how did you come to this? Well, yeah, I, I was like you. I assumed it had been not, I, it was from the previous book, which was about the 1908 Olympics. Okay. And uh, I was centering on three marathon runners at the 1908 Olympics. Yeah. And one of the runners, Johnny Hayes, who won the gold medal in 1908, Irish-American lad, 
um, he has a role in the 1912 Olympics. So, you know, doing the due diligence. Oh, okay. let me read about 1912. And there were all these biographies of Jim Thorpe. And that's great. And, right. you know, you get some great background. And so the number two most famous guy coming out of the 1912 Olympics was Duke Kahanamoku. Right. Uh, swimming gold medalist in the hundred. I mean, he was Michael Phelps and yes. Michael yeah. and uh, uh, Mark Spitz, etc. So I same thing. Sort of looked around. Well, let let me read that Duke Hanamoku book, <laughs> and I didn't find it. Incredible. And it yeah. was. And you know, there's you know various theories as to why, but um, I, you know, I I said, well, that's my next book. Right. And, and but it, it's and not it a magazine piece because there's way too much to cover. Yeah. And no, but that's what Absolutely. you have to sort of decide yeah. what you're going to do. Is it a newspaper piece of a thousand words, magazine piece ten thousand words, or let's go right? And you know, 000. this was a very. I mean, this ended up with a a, um, a university press, University of Nebraska. Who put so, out some great sports books? It's, yeah, it they, is. They it's really very, are good. Still yeah. Absolutely. One of the best baseball book publishers around. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And yet, it was something that the New York publishers are. You know, they have no clue. Yeah. You know, Hawaii, I can't. They can't even pronounce his name. Right. And, and that's, you know. Right. If your elevator pitch, the guy can't pronounce the name. You're in big, you know, you're in big trouble. Um, when but you do, thankfully, they took a chance on it. And when you do something like this, there's always going to, like we were saying before, there's always going to be things that come up that you're like, what? What were things that came up about Duke that surprised you? Yeah, probably not to be salacious, but the the you know affair quote unquote uh, with Doris Duke, mm -hmm. who at the time Doris Duke is the richest little girl in America. Mm -hmm. Her father was you know basically started Duke University, mm -hmm. um, and she while while she was young and married uh, moved to Hawaii and just fell in love with Hawaii and mm -hmm. fell in love with the Kahanamoku family. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of rumors that, that she had an affair with Duke Kahanamoku. She had an affair with Sam Kahanamoku. Mm -hmm. She was also, she was pregnant and lost the child. And there was also rumors that who, you know, in, in the, we're talking 1938, 39, this would have been an interracial mm -hmm. child. It would have been just incredibly controversial. Right. And, uh, you know, unfortunately the, the child died mm -hmm. um, at childbirth, so we, nobody knows. Mm. So that's still a mystery. If you don't know who Duke is, he is not only, of course, one of the great swimmers of all time, but he is, I think, one of the surfing magazines voted him surfer of the century. He is probably the single most influential person as far as making surfing mainstream. Not just in Hawaii, but when he came yes. over to California. And, I mean, there was the great Duke's restaurant on the on this Huntington <laughs> Beach Pier, Surf City, yep. with right. a statue of him right there. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One in Malibu too, right? Yes. Yeah. And I think there's one now in Newport. They've mm. or some somewhere Newport or something down there. But the controversial part about Duke in Hawaii, it has to do with again bringing surfing into the mainstream culture and sort of watering down whether it's a sport, whether it's a oh god, here a we go. Time. Here we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, the the other the other thing. I mean, you're asking, you know, what what about it was controversial and. I never thought about this going in, but, you know, at a time way before uh, Jackie Robinson, way before Joe Lewis, way before Jesse Owens, this is a dark-skinned Hawaiian man who is integrating, you know, clubs and pools. You know, beach, were, yeah, beaches, yeah. Were beaches, all, right. beaches were illegal. Right. right. Um, and yet he managed to do it. He encountered racism and prejudice. He managed to first of all show off his athletic prowess but he also had this grace and humility and just a personality that you know people loved him the babe ruth of his time right yeah, he was beloved right. and um he's this central figure in what, what was interesting about him was i was able to sort of um you know he's born in 1890 and he dies in 1968 and he he really you can tell the story of hawaii's development mm -hmm from a territory to statehood right. to Hawaii right. Five O through his life. He's wow. born into an independent Hawaii, yes. right? It, it, it was an independent country. It was a was kingdom, yeah. the kingdom of Hawaii. So let me ask you about this. Years <clears throat> and years ago, I was telling this to Tommy, there was some kind of anniversary of Lewis and Clark. So I'm doing a story and I'm gonna talk in that about Sacagawea. I, I go to call uh, some Native American at a particular tribe, I can't remember. And I just asked the question, oh, Sacagawea, what do you think? And and the guy said, well, you know, we admire her bravery and her strength, 
well, we have some conflicted feelings about it. I'm like, right. like an idiot. I'm like, why would that be? And he's like, well, she kind of just said, here it is, boys. Yeah, how about him? Yeah. Duke was known as the ambassador of Aloha. He was avuncular. He was sweet. He was wonderful. For many people, he not just introduced us to, to surfing, but not just the beauty of Hawaii, but the, the feeling you have in Hawaii of, of just kind of a, a good feeling. Is his legacy a little complicated now that there are people there who look at him and say, you're the one who brought all the, you brought people to exploit this? this There's stuff. some of that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And 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 that's a that's a, one of the challenges as, as a writer is, you know, to bring that out. Yeah. And also, but and to explain it in a way. And, and it was very hard because it was a subject that a lot of Hawaiians didn't want to address. In other words, he's such a big hero and people, they admire him on so many levels. And yet they also, you know, that flip side of, you know, he was such an outsider to begin with, and yet he became sort of this consummate insider. Mm -hmm. And he was part of the outrigger community, which is, you know, the Howley. Mm -hmm. He married a white woman. Um, he campaigned for statehood. Mm -hmm. Is there a feeling that he was he was used by these forces? There's there's yeah. some of that, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, I think to his credit, and, and maybe what he would answer is, um, you know, he loved Hawaii, and, yeah, right. and that and that always came through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, to him, that was important to say and to say, "Hey, we are here. Yeah. We're Hawaiian, and you know, we're we can we're big enough to embrace the yeah. world." Which, as you say, there were a lot of down. I mean, you look at Waikiki or whatever, and it's yeah. like, oh my gosh, it is overrun. You yeah. visited his grave then, and. Um, he was, he had a Beach Boy funeral, so he doesn't have a grave, but yeah, his, his I, monument, the monument yeah. and where his family is, is mm -hmm. buried is he's, his family's in the same, uh, cemetery as, uh, Abner Doubleday, oh. who oh, wow. ended right. up in Hawaii. Right. Oh, no and kidding. you go to Abner Doubleday's and it's people leave baseballs right, right. And, and all sorts right. of things. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So. Uh, the other brilliance about Dave is when he decides to do a book, he makes sure he has to go to Hawaii. <laughs> By the way, that was very good. That's very good. Work smart. <laughs> Working smart. That's very, very good. I'm, I didn't want to do the I did a rod this time, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to mention to you that uh, our friend Anthony Pignataro used to be the uh, editor of Maui Time and yeah. ran uh, a, a, a we had him on the show a month yeah. ago or so. He wanted us to ask you, uh, they just announced, I think it was like yesterday, they're going to make a movie about King Kamehameha, who's the right. other most famous Hawaiian. Right. And they have cast The Rock. The Rock. Yeah. <laughs> of, course. And, of course. And the guy who's writing it is the guy who wrote Braveheart. Right. I'm just curious, g given that you spent a lot of time, how do you think that's going to go over? Well, yeah. First, first of all, just uh, just on just on Duke, he yeah. would he came to the only time he lived for an extended period of time outside of Hawaii was when yeah. he came to Southern California in the twenties, and he came here to be in the movies when it was <gasps> silent movies, and the original plan was that he was going to play King Kamehameha. Did that so, yeah. yeah. So, which would have been you know fabulous, yeah. but it didn't happen, and. So, so that's one thing. Part of it on, on the objections, and, and there will be objections to this, um, the rock not being Hawaiian, right. the writer, screenwriter not being you know, Hawaiian <laughs> or, or, or acceptable uh, right. in a lot of ways. <laughs> right. Same with the director. Right. Um, there, there will be controversy for yeah. sure. And I will see how, we'll see what that, sort of script looks like and we'll yeah. see how that goes um i would imagine i you know anthony's right it, it's going to be controversial bet, yeah. and you know they've made a you know sort of cheapo tv movie about duke years ago and oh no kid yeah and, and remember who played him i i, I not offhand but it was you like, know a cast like greg luganus or anything <laughs> like that John Boyd. Yeah, exactly. who was the guy that played greg luganus uh, uh the actor the uh mario mario Pro oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. right okay. yeah it was something <laughs> like that right, like right. It, was, it was close but <laughs> right. and you know the irony of duke was you know he played I mean, he, he never made it in the movies because, again, he faced racism mm -hmm. and prejudice at the time. But he would play these extras like a Moor pirate or an Arab or a Native American Indian. Mm -hmm. And they never let him be, like, could you imagine just, like, a surfing hero? That right. would have been cool, you know? It's funny because you had mentioned Jim Thorpe earlier. If you mm. ever see the great Jimmy Cagney movie, White Heat, in which mm. he plays a complete psychopath, Jim Thorpe is actually in that, that movie. Right? It's, it's that just, right? yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> hey, I want to I want to ask uh, one more question about another enchanted land, Cleveland, and uh, we always ask John about this. John, did you what see? What you the, got? 
You see this kid that they just cut from the Browns? Yeah. I know, I know he's apparently because he broke the law. But I have apparently. to say, I'm kind of impressed. I mean, normally when you get <laughs> breaking the law, it's the usual DUI or you beat up a guy in a bar. This guy got kicked off for insider trading. That's right. Oh, right. right. Good for him. Yeah, he uh, <laughs> he got caught insider trading. Um, not good. Typically a uh, Martha Stewart level right. uh, crime. Um, but a white collar yeah. crime. You don't normally Very get the white collar crime. Yeah. Well, the, you figure these guys, you know, they got some money, right? They yeah. eventually would pull off some of crime like this. There is a good meme, though, because of uh, Carl, whatever his name is. I've been blanking on. Who's yeah. become a star? Carl Nassib. Nassib, yeah. Carl Nassib. Uh, he did that thing on Hard Knocks again where he was talking about the 10% interest. Yep. And uh, i blanking on the player with the insider trading right his return was 9.7 <laughs> so there's a picture of carl nassib at one of the games where he's just <laughs> <laughs> like got that look like what is wrong with you and it's with the tag uh when you hear your inside trading scheme is only netting you 9.7 return <laughs> i must have been when i saw that story i was trying to get mad i'm like i kind of admire the guy at least he's going kind of a and he like, just won a super bowl with the eagles last year right. this is his oh, first year on the browns it sounds oh, like yeah it sounds like a ballers enough. episode right well, don't what? you don't you think he's gonna get pardoned by donald trump of course he yeah. will i mean that's <laughs> that's that's yeah. like buddy yeah. buddy stuff as long as he doesn't flip <laughs> yeah. yeah which is the worst thing you can do apparently. if he knows anything and uh he flips to muller then and yeah, he's dead to him. <laughs> or if he kneeled Don't while kneel. he was he doing, can't kneel. While oh, he's if doing he kneeled, insider he's really trading. <laughs> yeah, if he hey, kneeled, he's screwed. This was so much better than last week. Thank you for oh. coming. We really do appreciate it, man. Thank because, you. No, like I said, last week was awful. <laughs> it was, and I don't know it what wasn't you do. That it wasn't that bad. Awful. <laughs> we did 10 minutes on Puerto Rico. That, <laughs> it was enjoyable. Yeah, thank God he spent through it. It was like 10 minutes. And uh, yeah. condensing that, I think I had to speed it up to 1,000 times. <laughs> was, so if you're really, really interested and you download it, you could uh, you know, slow it down 1,000 times. Do Just, and you can hear all the nonsense gibberish that we're talking. Okay. Well, thank, but thank you yeah. for having me, and thank you for the kind words. That's terrific. Very, very, very nice of you guys. Thank before you. we go, before yes. we go, uh, when we were talking about uh, the guys running on the field, how long did they have before Rick Monday came out and actually like grabbed the flag? They it wasn't very, very long, but they, I think they came in from the left field. They lit a match and it, it went out. Well, they yeah. they came in from left field. They went by Jose Cardenas. Cardenas. Yeah, and yeah. and put the flag down. They they sprayed a little like lighter fluid on it, mm -hmm. and you Vin Vin is making yeah. the call. And then they tried to light the match. The first match got blown out by the wind. They're writing this. They're lighting the second one, and Monday is, is already you know mm -hmm. running, and he just swoops down. And See, this up. is the thing that about the seventies and stuff that <laughs> like like blows my freaking mind. Yeah, like, how much time they had? Yeah, like when uh, yeah, they got the a video of Hank Aaron breaking right. the home run. Right. There's a dude just running down all the way down two third dudes. base. Two dudes. He kind of he kind of elbows them. Right. right. Haven't you know, they done a thirty on, for yeah. thirty on those guys yeah, right. yet? Or what? Right. Where's that Craig guy's Sager story? runs onto the field. Just meet him at home plate. What, are, what about, we, there's a photo in there, Morgana the Kissing Bandit. Right. I mean, a yeah, woman. Morgana, they did a 30 for 30 short on her, and right. like she made a whole deal. There's of a picture of a woman about... kissing Fernando on the mound. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. Was that not Same. her? No, no, it wasn't was, her. There was a no. different. It was a different. Morgana thing. was a different era. Oh, yeah. geez. Okay. <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised, actually, if these days players are specifically directed if someone comes on the field you get the hell away from them even if they're burning a flag you go somewhere else because the idea i i think nowadays would be that person must be packing so they're crazy enough to do that they've right. got a gun too and but, you're right when you but watch security that, would have tackled them before they even got to that well, but that's the bizarre thing about the aaron thing everybody knew leading up to that people were writing him letters saying i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna kill you i'm gonna kill you and two white guys two are on the field white guys run at him and nobody <laughs> thinks to tackle them and like, wasn't it in georgia yes yeah, yeah. yeah so it's like holy shit. <laughs> right. no no it's no, incredible since it, i know seven 14 was in, uh, in Cincinnati. Was in Cincinnati. 15. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah, but 15 was in Atlanta right. when right. that right. happens. Okay. Off Stop. of Al Downing and the Dodgers. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And Tom House catches the ball. Yeah. They right. know what happened with that ball. They do know what happened yeah. with that ball. But Buck, it, but Buckner it tried show. to scale the wall to get it. And the, you know what? The, 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 uh, the award for that was a Magnavox TV set. 
Oh, if, no if kidding. you got the ball, because that's what Aaron's sponsor was. Of oh. course, a Magna, uh, Magna Box TV set was as big as a two. <laughs> right, it was so huge. It was pretty nice. Right. Is, is Tom House now still? Is he at USC? USC, right? Yeah. He's the pitching guru. At USC. Oh, pitching he guru. teaches everybody how to throw footballs as a baseball. And right. Yeah. Nolan Ryan and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Was, was yeah. Stuff. Disciples. Yeah. Good stuff, man. Yeah. This was great. This was really good. Thank yeah. you. You saved hey. us. You really thank did. You. He's thank the you. he's the man. Uh, Tommy, Johnny, thank you very much. Terrific show. Follow Lovely. us on Twitter. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on iTunes. Us, and then listen to the Drill Morning Briefing every morning. Usually comes out about 8 in the morning. We tweet it's it out. Game uh, apps. Yeah. App. Game, game apps takes. app or take game, out our Twitter feeds app. and you can, you can get us there. Right. Thanks again, David. Thank, thank you. Dave. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Guys. Bye.